From Prague Spring to Paris riots, from the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. to the election of Richard M. Nixon, 1968 was a tumultuous time to say the least. Brian Meeks, Chair of Africana Studies at Brown University, and Ed Steinfeld, Director of Brown's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, sat down to reflect on a year marked by anti-establishment, anti-war, counterculture movements. Brian, thanks so much for chatting today. It's April 4th as we're speaking. It's the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And this year also marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of Africana Studies at Brown. But as I've really learned from you, 1968 was a year of extraordinary events, even beyond those that I just mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about what was happening in the world at that time? Well, you know, to begin at home, Ed, uh, 68 wasn't the year of our founding. It was the year when Brown students walked out because of the limited presence of black students, faculty, and courses addressing questions of the African-American community at Brown. And that protest set the stage for the formation of the Rights and Reason Theater a year later. And beyond that, the formation of an Afro-American studies program which later evolved into my department, Africana Rights and Reason. So in, in, in effect, it was the birthday as a result of a protest. But the very fact that it was a protest tells us all about what, what 68 was really about. It was an, an extraordinary upsurge of student, worker, just general citizen protest across the world. It was not an American phenomenon. It was not a new world phenomenon. It was an international phenomenon, which requires us to reflect on what it was, why this confluence of different movements uh, gathered together, as it were, in 1968. And of course, what it has meant um, whether we want to put it on a scale of bad to worse or just simply how has it affected um, the world since uh, 1968 in various ways um, for the better or for the worse or just simply in different directions. And that I think is, uh, we thought it was important, of course, uh, today is April 4th, uh, Martin Luther King's the anniversary of his death. So it's the anniversary of my father's birth, which is... Uh, important to me. I can never forget that date. Yeah. That was very much a part of the sequence of events. King's death, um, Robert Kennedy's assassination. There were not just demonstrations happening, but there were tragic events occurring which led to further mass upheavals and helped to dictate the future of events in this country and in other places. So I mean, if you think of, of the American events, or the events that affected the United States. I would probably begin with the Tet Offensive right. at the beginning of the year, which, of course, was the, the huge North Vietnamese offensive against uh, the American presence or against the South Vietnamese troops, which was surprising, was huge, and was ultimately not successful. But simply on its scale and the amount of damage that resulted from it. It said basically that North Vietnam was here to stay, that the insurgency was not going away, that winning it was not going to be easy, if at all possible. And that, I think, set the stage for the growth of the anti-war movement and the peace movement in the United States and supported worldwide, that this thing could not be won in a traditional sense. And that, I think, was almost like a marker, from, certainly from an American perspective, for the beginning of the year. But a lot of other things were going on. If you think about civil rights, civil rights was already in transition because of the extraordinary impact of the civil rights movement, but also the feeling among young people in particular, independent young people, that uh, there was too much violence against the demonstrators in exchange for the benefits that were being won. There was a great deal of impatience with where things were going, both in the South and particularly in the North among uh, black youngsters. People were swinging towards black power and a different definition of how to do battle. Yeah. My understanding is that the movement was shifting from a focus on civil rights almost exclusively Absolutely. to economic rights mm -hmm. and 
access, but also different, as you said, identity issues no, involving absolutely. nationalism. Absolutely. For example, in the North, the overt civil rights Jim Crow questions were not in the forefront. There were questions of housing. There were questions of access to trade union rights and the benefits that resulted from that. Martin Luther King himself was in the very end struggling to bring together city sanitation workers around questions of unionization as well as cross race, cross ethnic interests, so to speak. Right. And and workplace so, safety, workplace and, safety and, and wages. Absolutely. And Different currents were coming to the fore. And the, the northern currents in particular and concerns were were not quite the same set of concerns as in the South. And that, I think, was captured under the slogan of Black Power and the, the new mood that was sweeping black people. And that was also a part of a broader move, which was, was sweeping white youngsters, students on campuses throughout the country. You know, the formation of Students for a Democratic Society, the growth of the peace movement, again, an effect of the war in Vietnam, but having its own momentum. The, the growth of the hippie movement, which might be seen as perhaps not exactly in the same direction as the peace movement or the sort of growing left-wing student movement as such, but which was disconnecting from the status quo. So you have these multiple layers of, if you want it, countercultural or anti-establishment movements, which are gathering force in 1968. You had mentioned Tet in early 68, but the Cultural Revolution was also raging in China, had been raging since Absolutely. 1966. So Chairman Mao and the, the Red There's Book the Red and Book. students yeah. mobilized in, in China, mobilized in France, it seems, uh, anti-colonial movements. And again, as I've learned from you, this was not, it wasn't just an international event, but across multiple continents. Absolutely. Let's for the moment focus on the obvious uh, European case. We have uh, the Prague Spring, in, right in Czechoslovakia, right, which is in purportedly communist country, but which is arguing for a different kind of relationship with the state, which is arguing for a more democratic form of communism, and of course that movement comes to an, an abrupt end when Soviet tanks enter Prague and essentially put it down and arrest Dubček and the the people who are leading a different approach to really existing socialism, to use the term that right. the Soviets used to use at that point in time. So that's going on in Czechoslovakia. And in France, of course, the May events, and most people think about 68, think about France and the huge student uh, worker alliances which emerged in a very French fashion, if you think about the history of France uh, from the revolution through the 19th century, you have these broad-based movements. You know, perhaps the most significant one of the 20th century occurs in 1968 with the, the alliances which bring France to a grinding halt, but which ultimately, and this is another point that we need to make, is what were the tangible successes of these events? We have mass mobilization. And were there any tangible links between those? How were those events speaking to one another? I think there is the beginning of a conversation going on. In some instances, that conversation is much tighter. If we think about the North Atlantic linkages, there are real connections going on between what is happening in France, what is happening in the United States, what is happening in Britain, where the anti um Anti-nuclear weapons movement is gaining significant purchase, but there's also an anti-Vietnam movement, which is extraordinarily vibrant in Britain. You know, there's a sort of Anglo-Atlantic popular connection mm -hmm. which is going on and which is driving that. And so it's responding very much to what the United States is doing in Vietnam and calling on the British government to take a less supportive position than it typically takes with the United States. It's extraordinary to me how many different threads of anti-establishment, anti-status quo movements there were across very different kinds of systems. Precisely. And I'm reminded in some ways of the present in that you have things like Brexit yeah. in the UK, you have the election of Donald Trump without really the support of either establishment 
party in any meaningful way in the U.S. and France, Macron. In China, a rejection of certain institutions under, under Xi Jinping. It feels like another moment, different politics, but another moment of somehow, if not connected, at least simultaneous anti-establishment, anti-status quo movements across many different places. Can we learn something from what happened 50 years ago and apply it to the present? Are they related? Well, I think they're related in the sense in which polar opposites are related because they're part of the same political game. But they are polar opposites. If you think about Brexit, if we think about Donald Trump, if we think about the sort of nationalism that is implicit in that, 1968 was very much the beginnings of a movement beyond narrow nationalism, which was seeking to bridge connections across countries in the direction of a sort of democratic populism. I wonder whether we're witnessing yeah. a sort of a countercurrent in some well, ways to, well, to 1968. Part of the reality is that 68 was followed very quickly by its countercurrents which have right. never really lost power or have gained force in many respects since then. If you think about the specific case of the United States and the election of Nixon at the end of that period, or you think about the popular upsurgence around the Democratic Convention, mm-hmm. and then very close to that, the defeat of the Democrats and the emergence of Nixon and what Nixon meant for the consolidation of a more rightward direction in American politics. 68 showed the possibility of transnational, popular, democratic world. But it failed. It failed to consolidate. And of course, this world was never united by a common program or anything. It was more united by an ethos, which was the ethos that all politics didn't run through the state, that everything was political in the sense that the questions of sexual revolutions, the question of race, if you counterpoise Prague to Paris to what is happening you know, in the resistance against racism in the South in the United States, then you, you can link together a sort of popular democratic impulse, which was at the heart of 68 but which failed. It failed in the short term to be successful in Prague. It failed in Paris. It failed to change the politics of the U.S. in a fundamental way. In fact, the politics of the U.S. consolidated in a different direction under Nixon. And of course, we've had much history since then. You know, Carter comes back, but then Mm -hmm. Reagan comes back. And then neoliberalism, which is a way of looking at the world in a different way, but very much connected. There do seem to be some kinds of changes in identity, sexual identity, sexual preference, Absolutely. gender, of course, not wholly a story mm-hmm. of progress, but some of these changes seem to be more lasting and less ephemeral. Absolutely, and have stuck. Uh, you, you pointed to perhaps the most successful question has been around gender. Advances have been made on race. You know, anyone who thinks that the United States is where it was in 1967 should look back on some of the the documentaries that were produced around that time and to see the progress that has been made. But, you know, they're all saying the more things change, the more they remain the same. There's so much more to be done building on the foundations that were laid then. So, of course, on, on questions of race, questions of gender, there have been huge successes. The entire environmental movement, whose roots, of course, precede 1968, but which were echoed in the hippie intervention and in the question of living with nature and so on and so forth, and how that reflected a sentiment that wanted to move towards a greater peace with the environment. That has made huge advances. Of course, all of these things now are certainly in an American context are being put in the eyesight of a regime which seems to want to have an entirely new approach to gender, to perhaps to race, certainly to immigration. Yeah, it seems that 68 and the current moment underscore the fragility of institutions and norms and rules in, in positive and negative ways that what we take as absolutely fixed and unchangeable can come crashing down so quickly. And I think for Americans, that's a that's a very unfamiliar lesson. But for other for some Absolutely. other people in China, for example, it's it's now maybe taken for granted or a real fear that what we take as fixed and unchangeable and stable can, you know, in the, with a snap of a, a few fingers yeah. disappear quickly. 
Well, I think, you know, and, and you, of course, will, will know this far better than I do, but the, the, the Chinese concept of time and of history is on a very different scale than anybody in the West. You know, the West is, as, as we know it now, um, post Montezuma is, right. is, is 500 years old, the widest definition. That is simply one epoch in Chinese history. So therefore, the sense of change, maybe what was laid in 1968 in terms of the mental mindset about what the relationship between people, the relationships between people and the state, the relationships between people as a whole and the environment. Maybe all of these things have been set on the agenda of human history and the, the short-term political setbacks uh, might be less important than the long-term ways in which people look at these relationships in a fundamentally different way. I think that's such an important point on, on this day as I reflect on Martin Luther King's mm -hmm. legacy and his his lessons. And I'm, of course, a, a not sufficiently informed observer of that and student of that history. But my sense is that uh, Martin Luther King himself expressed a kind of tension between patience, a, an optimism that the arc does bend toward justice yeah. in the long run versus an ending of patience and a desire yeah. to see change now and, and an unwillingness. And maybe in that sense, a convergence with more uh, uh, aggressive, I'm not sure what the right word is, threads of the civil mm -hmm. rights movement to say, we, we can't just wait. And I guess today too, we face that tension, that optimism that over the long run, it will work out. And and an impatience and a desire to move now. Well, we, we need to remember King himself put his, his body and his life on the line, as did so many other people in that movement and in those times. Um, was arrested you know, many times and ultimately paid the ultimate sacrifice of his own life. Uh, but the risk-taking, patience with, risk, with constant risk-taking, is perhaps a, the best way to define King's legacy, in that he was out there, he was in jail, he was um, disliked by vast swathes of the population who, who thought that he was uh, an agitator. Uh, you know, the FBI certainly didn't think much about him at the time. Right. And uh, yet he, he put his body on the line, paid the ultimate price, has set an example of what is possible. There are so many other people who did that. And if you think about the simple image that has just come to my mind, and I suspect it's from the Chicago Convention, of a young man putting a flower into the barrel of a raised right. National Guard's rifle. Right. And it kind of, you know, has become iconic and it, it looks cute, but, you know, it could have ended in a very different way. Right. And um, he was willing to do that. He was making a profound point about um, peacetime resistance because putting, uh, approaching that rifle and putting that flower was an act of resistance, if nothing else. Yeah. This 50th anniversary of so many things and <laughs> in 1968 and in, including the we'll call it the birth the birth date yeah. of Africana yeah. at Brown can you talk a bit about some of the the intellectual activities the sure. scholarly activities Absolutely. that that you're planning for to yeah. mark the 50th yeah. well you know we've we've been playing with this for some time maybe not long enough uh, but we we've come up with a, a set of activities that begin at uh, Brown's commencement this year. We're going to have four days of looking at the music of 1968. Fantastic. And what, we, what, what essentially the format will be is a series of gatherings at Africana's Rights and Reason Theatre in which we get experts on the music of 68 to talk about different genres and their impact. So we'll be playing music. We'll be interacting with the audience and with the people present as to the meaning of of the music yeah we've, we've been talking mostly about politics and social movements absolutely. but the, the unbelievable um explosion of creativity of that year yeah. it's it's just yeah. amazing and it must be connected somehow to the other ferment that was yeah, going and, on and at both ends both as product of and as extraordinary influence driver on, of right and driver of the events and you know if you think of if you don't include just the year 1968 alone, but yeah. the lead up to and the, the immediate aftermath right. in terms of the music, then there is this extraordinary generator of popular culture, 
which which occurs in this period, you know, Martha Van, Amanda Vandellas dancing yeah. in the street, James Brown, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, the, the whole Woodstock phenomenon and the music that came out of it and what Jimmy that Hendrix, meant. Jimi Hendrix, Bob Jim Hendrix, Marley. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, it's, it's amazing. And of course, there is not so much on, on the forefront of the popular movement, but on the side, the, the emergence of avant-garde jazz, which occurs slightly before, but then overlaps with 1968, you know, people like Coltrane, Pharaoh Sanders, right. Archie Shep, there are a whole set of people who change the whole mood, not for the first time is this happening, but change the whole mood, style, and rhythm of, of jazz, uh, undoubtedly affected by the civil rights movement and the black power movement, mm -hmm. and um, reacting to it and also influencing it. So we're going to be looking at a number of different genres. We're certainly going to be looking at sort of popular music. We're going to be looking at rhythm and blues in particular, Great. at jazz. We'll be looking at reggae, and we're actually getting a good friend of mine, Ibo Cooper, who was leader of a very iconic reggae band called Third World, which, which wasn't Bob Marley and the Whalers, but not very far behind. Yeah. They, they, often, they often opened for Bob Marley and the Whalers. And he'll be coming here with a singer to, to sort of demonstrate, uh, articulate the movement of reggae around this period and how it led to the, the popular forms which emerged uh, in the 1970s. And we're going to have uh, someone who is a dance expert and is going to do the dances of 1968. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. So the, we're going to begin with these series of events at commencement. Then things are really going to happen in the fall. We're going to have a play on the student walkout at Brown, which will be staged a couple of times. And we're going to really reflect on what that meant. And that will occur in early September. Then, of course, you know that because Watson is working with Africana on a global 68th seminar, which we're going to hold in November. And um, the lineup for this is going to be really remarkable. For two days, we're going to have some of the leading scholars uh, who have worked on the question of 68 or on the post-colonial question centered around that period, uh, that post-war period when decolonization was happening rapidly. And we're going to try to bring in a cross-section of people from different places uh, and different interests uh, who will be talking about what did 68 mean? What did that convergence mean? And where is it going? And, you know, the list is just fantastic. Um, our lead speaker is going to be Ashil Mbembe from the Cameroon, who is at the University of Wits in South Africa. And um, the, the list of speakers, where I had to have the time, I'd, I'd, I'd start to run them off, but it's going to be quite an event. And, of course, you know all about it because you're involved with us on this one. Well, it's a privileged force. This is such an important event for our own intellectual development here at Watson. But, of course, this isn't about Watson. It's about the Brown scholarly community. And Absolutely. this kind of cooperation between Africana and Watson is something that I, I think it's not just essential for what we do. It offers so many interesting opportunities for intellectual creativity and opportunities, of course, to reflect on history, but also to reflect on our current moment and Absolutely. where we're going and how to understand it and maybe how to affect positive change. Absolutely. And I, I, I just think that um, I should add to that, uh, while agreeing with everything you say, that, of course, we're also planning to have a keynote speaker, not as part of this conference, but as a keynote for all of these events and at the end of it. And that will probably be early in 2019. Great. We're still trying to tie down who that is, but right. we hope it is somebody who will uh, attract uh, vast masses of people on a 1968 scale. Right. I think that... Of course, I feel that the keynote speakers, the invited speakers are essential yeah. for um, invigorating the conversation. At the same time, in the spirit of 68, I feel that what's most important is lots of participation by the community, lots of maybe challenging of hierarchies, or at least putting aside the hierarchies and getting as many voices as possible and as many different kinds of people as possible, as many different backgrounds as possible into this discussion and Absolutely. maybe celebrating that kind of inclusion. We're hoping that that happens. And um, we're, you know, I should say from our side that we're extraordinarily happy that Africana is in on this. Um, Watson, we think it's a, an opportunity. 
and we look forward to it being successful. Oh, I really look forward to it. It's one of the uh, things that makes me most excited about being here at Brown right now. Brian, thanks so much for taking the time, and I can't wait to continue this conversation and this cooperation in the months to come. Congratulations on the 50th anniversary, the, the birth date of Africana Studies Thank you. at Brown. Thanks. Ed. This has been Trending Globally, Politics and Policy. If you enjoyed today's conversation, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, or download us on your favorite podcasting app. If you like us, rate us and help others who might enjoy the show find us. For more information, go to watson.brown.edu.